Uh, Nina Sarkeesian was driving the anti-Gamergate faction. Well, recently she had a birthday party where she married herself. Oh dear. I think we undervalue how much humans who live good lives are rewarded within their lives for those decisions. And that I think we focus too much on rewards that happen posthumously, like mm -hmm. heaven, hell, people who are choosing these ultra progressive life paths. You don't need to wait till they're dead to be laughing at them. Wait until they're 35, okay? It could be worse. At least you're not Anthony Burge. It could be worse. At least you're not Anthony Burge. Would you like to know more? It's something very naughty. Well, I should have been working through lunch. Instead of creating new NDC accounts on Lufthansa Spark platform for all of our agents, which I did on a delayed basis, I instead read, uh, read Susie Weiss's new article in the free press called Ooh, What's It On? Herkel Durkle is the new way to self-care ourselves to death. And it is about a an ongoing trend predominated by women related to this concept of self-care, also highly related to what is referred to as bed rot or bed rotting or soft living, which is basically oh, quiet quitting as well. It's related to that, which is basically just about giving up, indulging in your feelings, not working hard, doing the bare minimum and in doing whatever you do that makes you feel good is justified and right. And it was an interesting they, article. I they hadn't heard of this. Is it an ancient Scottish thing or a modern Scottish Herkel thing? Herkel Durkle is a Scottish term for like <coughs> hunkering down in your bed and kind of being cozy. There are other. I Northern never heard of when I was in Scotland. Just so people know, I got my undergraduate degree in Scotland and lived there for four years. Yeah, but like um, there are no there are no Scottish people in St. Andrews. I don't, I, a very few because it's really hard to get into that university. Two thirds. So. I think. Yeah. Or, okay. Or yeah. Just, like, oh yeah. Cause there's a lot of English people. Yeah. I think it's about the third Scottish when I went there at least just so people know it's now the top rated university in the UK higher than Oxford and Cambridge. Um, man. And uh, yeah, really cool. Also Anyways. University. But I think this is very related to the topic that we're about to discuss, which is that feminists have won the culture war, but they've lost it life. And I, I mean, I'm reading this article and I'm thinking, Okay, so I, I think it's actually wider than that. So I'm going to expand the topic of this episode to mm -hmm. include another one that I wanted to do. Okay, which was really made clear to me about why leftists are so miserable. When I was in in a, another recent episode where we were talking about, and I was appreciating you, and I was going through old Facebook posts, you had mentioned that I had made our life like the end scene from Gladiator. Yeah, this is their heaven. You know, he goes to a farm where he grows food, and he has beautiful fields, and he has a kid and a wife, and they play together. <laughs> room worth one good man's life. We believed it once. Make us believe it again. Right? And that historically speaking, this would have been considered heaven. The life that we live every day today would have been considered heaven. Mm -hmm. And yet leftists would consider it this almost impossible toil because we wake up every day with meaning and believe we have to work. And I think it's not appreciating. They're like, but my life is harder than my parents. I don't get things as easily as my parents got things. I don't have to, you know, plan as much. I don't, I, I have to sacrifice more. And it's like, yes. And then you have like your great, great grandparents, like looking on at horror in you in this infinitely privileged state, you know, not constantly, struggling to survive being like well things are marginally harder than the previous generation my grocery bills are high and it's it's shown something to me that really horrifies me about where the left has gone which is that people who live life in a pursuit of pleasure will never know peace because they don't have things that really matter in life that they strive for.
And they can be like, well, the right doesn't either. And I'm like, you do not lynch the, listen to like rightist music. You know, one of our favorite songs is By Dirt, for example. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's a great song. It makes me cry every time. It makes you cry every time? It really does, though. Yeah, it's a great song. But it's a great example of like coalition co coalition of rightist values that are, are being taught to people which is very similar to these you know roman like values the goal is to have your plot of land that you get after the military service and then you spend your life raising a family there and that time with them that's not punishment like in leftist memes because i love following i'm following like all of the facebook groups for like the anti-natalists and stuff like that here's one of the memes from the group with a stork delivering a guy a baby and him looking sad and saying no i ordered a lifetime of doing whatever i want and it's like can you imagine any poverty higher than just doing whatever you want whenever you want to do it any hell greater than a life lived in search of personal indulgence because in the end that never satisfies anyone they have literally created tantalus's punishment for themselves for those who forget tantalus's punishment it was whenever he would reach down to sip water the water would recede from him and whenever he would lift up to grab a fruit the fruit branches would pull away from him and that's what looking for satisfaction in pleasure is like. When you reach from it, it pulls away from you. It's the antithesis of satisfaction. They act like, oh, kids, what a burden. I don't get to travel the world anymore. I don't get to, you know. Bro, have you even traveled? I mean, oh, man. Like, we, every time I leave the house now, like at this age, I'm like, I used to like traveling when I was younger. But now yes. I just want to be back home with the kids. It's such a hit of life quality whenever we travel now. <laughs> Yes, back on the farm, right? And so this is really interesting to me when I view it in a culture war perspective. Hmm. And where this was really elevated for me and where I really began to pay attention to this was the, the fate of Anita Sarkeesian. So people who don't know Anita Sarkeesian, because I had to remind Simone of this. I was like, do you know her? Because I, I found a, a fact about her that really shocked me Man, recently. Man, I don't know anyone. So during Gamergate 1, um, now we're in Gamergate 2, Electric Boogaloo. Our episode on that just went live today, which I absolutely love. But Gamergate 1, Anita Sarkeesian was really driving the anti-Gamergate faction. And she ran a podcast called Feminist Frequency. And she ran a number of like YouTube things where she would just like lie all the time. Uh, I mean, leftists always do this. One of my favorites was um, she had video clips from a game where, where the, the character was like piling corpses of hookers who he had killed. But this wasn't like part of the game. This is something that was like, it was like a Grand Theft Auto or something. <laughs> this is something she had chosen to do with her character film and then whine about. And Gamergate 1 was a really interesting moment because it was like when the left fully began to embody like what before would have been the extremist like Christian parent. Like, ah, oh, video games are horrible. They're from the devil and they're hurting my kids and we need to get rid of all games and all sexy tracer butt and every character who looks remotely arousing to men and everything, everything must be made clean and nice. Uh, and she had taken over this perspective, but did it in a very lefty sort of a fashion. Well, recently she had a birthday party where she married herself. Oh dear. And it made me realize something that I think we undervalue how much humans who strive and successfully live good lives are rewarded within their lives for those decisions. And that I think we focus too much on uh, rewards that happen posthumously, like mm -hmm. heaven, hell, stuff like that. You know, like the Westboro Baptist Church, apparently they used to tell even with glee to reporters, oh, well, you're going to go to hell and you'll be burning in hell and I'll be laughing then. I'm like, to those of our young viewers, people who are choosing these ultra progressive life paths, you don't need to wait till they're dead to be laughing at them. Wait until they're 35. OK, and they marry themselves. This is something that we've seen in the data since 
Pew started recording statistics on happiness differences between progressives and conservatives, with progressives showing markedly lower rates of happiness on average. But what's really interesting is it's something that has become markedly worse recently, specifically as the data relates to mental health. So I'm going to quote summarize an article here titled How to Understand the Well-Being Gap Between Liberals and Conservatives by Mulsa al Gabri. In a recent essay for Social Science and Medicine Mental Health, epidemiologist Catherine Gimbrone and her co-authors identified a significant gap in depressive attitudes between liberal and conservative teens. The gap was present in all years observed in the study, 2005 to 18, but it grew significantly starting in 2012. However, as depressive affect unilaterally spiked among liberals three years later, Conservatives also began reporting increases in depression, although that rise tapered off relatively quickly while the increase among liberals continued. Liberal girls tended to be significantly more depressed than boys, particularly after 2011. However, ideological differences swamped gender differences. Indeed, liberal boys were significantly more likely to report depression than conservatives of either gender. The authors also found the more educated a teen's family was, and here I should note educated isn't how smart they were, but how long they spent in the ultra-progressive brainwashing institutions, the more likely the young people were to be depressed, and the more dramatic their rise in depression was after 2012. So what we're seeing here is the actual and real harm that is being done to people and their children by these progressive brainwashing factories and that this harm is increasing over time. This is not a steady state. As progressives become more extreme, as the system is falling off the rails, people are being hurt more and more and more. But I want to talk about some of the ideas they were promoting and why it obviously led to this and sort of how hollow this is. The marrying of herself is an affirmation of self-love, which we have always promoted as being terrible idea on the show. Loving yourself for who you are right now is a terrible thing. If, if, if you want to admire yourself, admire yourself for who you have the potential to become. This is the same with your partner. You yeah. should never, ever be buried to somebody who loves you for who you are. Oh, my gosh. Um, that's, well, that's what so many of these movements are about. Quiet quitting and herkle durkle, which is just being cozy in bed much longer than you're supposed to be and mm-hmm. spending all your time in bed and quiet quit. Like it, it's it's in soft life too, or soft living. All of this is accepting yourself for who you are and, and even making yourself worse and then liking that even more. It's hard for me to wrap my head around it. So I, I'm going to read you a quote from Anita Sarkeesian that was posted in 2016. So it might've even been older than that. So this gives you an idea of what she was talking about long before her life path led her to this sad outcome. Having stories that center women encourages us to see women as people who are important to their own lives and intrinsic humanity rather than defining them in relationship to men. So she wanted a world where women's importance was who they were in and of themselves. And that this teaching hurts young girls because it leads them to view men oppositionally instead of the way that all you know successful cultures do historically is to view women and men as a team okay Mm. we work together and this is also one of the problems with the red pill movement you know a lot of these red pillars who went out there and were just sex 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 some of them got out of it and they ended up finding partners and now they recant their old ways like like good long-term partners like the guy who wrote the game i think um actually did this i think he's in a monogamous marriage now i'll look this up and and do a, a post update on this yep neil strauss is now in a monogamous marriage with a kid and regrets that lifestyle as does almost everyone who pursues it it it's as bad like this ultra red pill lifestyle is as bad and as unsatisfying as the ultra lefty lifestyle it is a hell that people impose upon themselves because they are living lives without honor and not for something greater than themselves when you live a life only for yourself you don't get that gladiator send-off everyone's like well that was that was a stupid waste of everyone's time when you die. But he's like, yeah, everything I, I said there was a terrible idea. Don't do that. I tried it. 
it does, it's not that it doesn't work in terms of getting sex. It's just that that life isn't satisfying. But she never learned that. She spent her entire life in search of self-glorification and gratification. And people can say, oh, that's so sinful. But it's not sinful. Like so many of these sins that are passed to us by old religious traditions aren't sins because, you know, some, you know, arbitrary God is jealous of where we're putting our attention. They're sins because they destroy yourself. They destroy your own soul. They destroy your own potentiality, your own place in this world. And then they lead you into these sad cry fests where for a birthday, like we don't even celebrate our birthdays anymore, Simone. The idea of celebrating, like why, why would we? You might mention and I'll like, I don't know what, like, what, what do you get on a person? Like a massage or something? We certainly don't care about like. We exchange gifts and we'll try to make the other person's favorite meal. That's kind of it. But that's normal for adults, isn't it? Yeah, but this is because our every day, and this is something you've mentioned recently to me, is almost as good as life can be. Yeah, it really, I don't know how to make it better. <laughs> yeah. But I'd love your thoughts on this because you were in this sort of feminist culture early on when you were mm -hmm. younger. I think you certainly would have identified as a feminist in college. And Can I was you... certainly encouraged to engage in self-care and all of it made me mentally weaker and worse. So I think the problem people don't think about enough is when you don't have something bigger to worry about, all the tiniest things make you worried. So if your focus in life is not on something like your career or running the world or whatever it might be, right? Raising a family, then it's going to be on, oh, I, I don't know if I can take a shower today or I'm so nervous about leaving the house to go put mail in the mailbox. And I think that everyone can relate to the fact that everyone fills up their day with the same general and it obviously like if you're in a war scene or if you are subject to huge amounts of stress or you're sick it's different but on average everyone fills their lives with the same amount of stress and with concern and with thought and work but when you the president of the united states isn't necessarily working that much harder or that much busier or whatever than someone who is at home doing absolutely nothing, like a housewife who's an empty nester who has absolutely nothing to do. So both of them are like, oh man, like there's just, I have to do this and I have to do that. And then I have to get this. And they're all worrying about things constantly. But the housewife empty nester at home is worrying about her own anxiety levels and what she's going to eat next and how she's going to make yoga class work and how she's going to deal with that woman that she hates so much at the checkout line. Whereas the president is worried about, oh gosh, how should I do the drone attack? Should I not kill the people? Should I kill the people? And then how do I deal with this press nightmare? But it's it, it all fills the same cup. We're not that different in the end. And well, what I worry so much about this, this female empowerment being turned into self-care mm -hmm. is that people are now throwing away these beautiful chalices that have so much potential and just taking these dumb little paper cups and filling them with absolute piss. And that is their lives now. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a paper club of piss instead of a chalice of holy water. Yeah. And they're just sitting there drinking it. No, and that is the truth. I think the key of what causes this is the mantra of self-care. The mantra that my life should be dedicated to me being comfortable with my existence. And when you elevate your own self-acceptance to the highest level of importance within life, and then secondarily, society's acceptance of you, mm. everything you do matters so little. Because you know that everything you do is for personal affirmation, as opposed to a thing of higher value. You have created an ideological system which is appealing to people in the moment, but that cannot, intrinsically cannot provide any meaningful satisfaction. Because you always know personally the full amount of satisfaction that has been delivered from your pursuits. And we've talked about this in other videos, but it's a very important concept. When you dedicate yourself to any form of hedonism, by hedonism, we don't just mean general, like any form of like maximizing your own emotional subset, you know and experience the full value of everything you do. And you realize how trivial that value is. 
and you begin to hate yourself more and more and more and more of what you do becomes a delusional hamster wheel of trying to make your life feel like it has value. And you end up then, as you preach this, destroying the lives around you. A great example of this was Anita Sarkeesian is Anthony Dirk. You Could Be Anthony Dirk has got to be one of my favorite songs on the internet. Uh, I'll play a little clip of it here, but you guys really need to check it out. It is a great song about a male feminist who was left by his wife after they were in an open marriage for <laughs> another guy who she was banging instead of him and took his Wii U. It could be worse. At least you're not Anthony Birch. At least you're not Anthony but Be the head writer for a game studio Enjoy an open relationship with your wife End up divorced with her taking your wheel They don't rhyme but if those things apply You might be Anthony Birch You might be Anthony Birch If you're ever feeling sad, just remember at least you're not Anthony Birch A message from V the Musical and he is one of his frame prized possessions with a framed letter from Anissa Sarkeesian saying something like, you are more tolerable than most men. And it's like, gosh, like part of me wants to feel pity for him, but I know the toxicity of his ideology and feeling pity for these ultra leftists, I think is equivalent to feeling pity for Nazis and stuff like that, because they believe their cultural beliefs to be superior to other people's cultural beliefs. And they want to eradicate cultural diversity from this world and diversity from this world um, and er eradicate people who they see as being savages, you know, half child, half animal. They really are the modern uh, example of imperialist culture. And it is, sickening to me anyone who allows it, this to invade their mind but we are fortunate and that this very ideology this very toxic ideology ends up destroying them and then when they you know when these women hit like 45 and they're no longer able to use their sexuality to get ahead which is what gamergate one was about it was about women using their sexuality to get ahead in the workplace and then you know, sleeping with potential people they were interviewing and stuff like that, and then acting as if that was totally okay and they didn't have an unfair advantage. But once they can no longer use that, because they blinded themselves to these advantages they had, and that's what Gamergate was, was. It was women in the gamer the game media community taking soldering irons to their own eyes to not see how much their own sexuality was benefiting them because that's they didn't the see that. They didn't see how much they would suffer when they lost their attractiveness. They didn't see how irrelevant and discarded they would immediately come become from the perspective of the very community they thought they were building. Because this community was completely built around their sexual value. And it's so funny that that is what modern feminism became, is elevating and hiding that women were using their sexual value to cheese their careers. And now that they can't do that anymore, they have nothing left and they're living these lives of abject sadness that is so far removed from this, you know, heaven at the end of Gladiator. Yeah, but also what's sad about this, and you can deride them all you want, is they were told they were doing the right thing. They were doing the ethical thing. They were very, very deeply misled. And they're no, the Nazis. The ones being heard. I don't, no. I don't think they, they were told they were doing the right thing. They should have applied critical thought. And they didn't. Humans they just, they, now this is going to be very hard for you to understand, but most humans do not do this naturally. And you do either. I think it's a mixture. When you look back at your genetic heritage, you come from a long line of people who question norms and the status quo. But then on top of that, a lot of things happen to you throughout your life that confirmed the fact that you cannot and should not trust anyone. <laughs> so you are in a very rare circumstance where both dispositionally and in terms of your education, you have been told to question and to not trust. The vast majority of people are not like that, either dispositionally or in terms of how they've been taught to succeed in the world. And most people are rewarded for going along with the rest of society and punished severely 
for not, you will still even are punished severely for deviating from people's preferred views. And it can still hurt you. It just, you've learned enough in life and you personally probably just couldn't wrap your head around thinking differently. But no, I, 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 I mean, <sighs> we're determinists, right? We, we, we think that people are kind of sort of stuck in their mechanical futures through a me mechanistic view of the world. But I mean, so it is their fault, but it's not their fault that they're, it's their fault. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to word this another way, because a lot of people can be like, well, that's so uncaring. Look, if someone is like a child murderer and they're like, yeah, but I was graped as a kid and that's why I'm a child murderer. I'm like, yeah, yeah or my parents were murderous. As yeah. Well. Or my parents were abusive to me and we're like, okay, well you might've inherited this, but I hate you in the same way I hate your parents. Because... Yeah. And you, you are still dangerous to society and not doing good things. Well, so no, but I also think something. deserving of punishment. Hmm. I think that Anita Sarkeesian is deserving of the terrible life she lives. She earned it from her lack of personal industry. And she, you know, it's called a bonfire of the vanities for a reason. People burn in a bonfire of their own vanity. And this is something that we as a society used to communicate and accept. And the feminists didn't know this. And they did win the short-term culture war, right? Like they got the positions of power in society, yeah. but they lost themselves. They spent their own existences because they were fighting for an ideology that was fundamentally evil. It was an ideology that believed itself to be naturally superior to all other ideologies. They believed it had a manifest destiny to erase all cultural diversity in the world, to, to be the only ideology. And they're like, no. -uh. And I'm like, okay, but you do want to spread your ideology to Africa. You do want to spread your ideology to East Asia. When they're like, yeah, but like only the good parts... And I'm like, yeah, but the good parts to you is literally your entire world perspective. You'll let them keep their holidays, but that's about it. And they're like, well, we're really saving them. We're saving them from savagery. And it's like, yeah, that's what imperialists have always thought. You, you are disgusting human beings. And at least the imperialism of the old days brought prosperity to the areas that it colonized, which it did, just objectively did. Yeah, whereas this culture seems to shred prosperity, culture. which is really sad. But this new prosperity <clears throat> saps regions of their industrial productivity. You mean this it, new movement saps this, the regions Well, no, of it's this new iteration of the same movement. I mean, it, it is European imperialism. It is a movement that comes from the European cultural value sets and sees itself as naturally superior to other groups. It is the secular imperialism that drove y Europe it, it, that has been reformed as what we now call progressivism and wokeism. And uh, yeah, it it is interesting to me to see this, but it's a little satisfying. And I think when you contextualize this, when you show your kids this and you're like, look, these people are like marrying themselves and this is not a happy outcome. You know, they, they are, they're going to die with like 60 cats and then the cats are going to eat their corpse because well, that's sustainable, isn't it? And that would cut they, down. They love the most, don't love them, and just see them as a carry-on source of food. And, and for people, what, what, what was that about? It's the Tibetan sky burial of single, of progressive women. women. Yeah, I, I, you know, let's just make it a thing. Let's make it cool. We need to have that. That would be a good T-shirt. Progressive. Progressive feminist Tibetan sky burial, and it's a woman <laughs> being eaten by her cats. If we ever get really big, we can we can make a little shirt about that. The, the progressive sky burial. Gosh, but uh, no, I mean it's it's sad. It's sad, but it is just. And they won the short term cultural battle, but long term. I mean, I really think Gamergate's where things begin to turn around, as we talked about in the other video. And we'll do another video at some point on Gamergate really exposes the left's core weakness. And mm -hmm. Gamergate 2 does as well. It exposes how you can finally beat progressivism. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is that when our daughters are old enough, we just need to show them that the outcomes are probably not in line with what they want. And we have no problem with them adopting whatever values they want after mm -hmm. they have weighed and measured the evidence and everything they've learned. But I think focusing 
our kids around outcomes instead of ideologies is key in just making sure that they make better decisions. Yeah, I really hope so. I hope that we're able to protect them because I do worry for them. Going into this world, there's going to be a lot of people, especially if we continue to gain public notoriety, who in the same way they did with Elon's kids are going to specifically target our kids. Yeah, well, Torsten is just going to scream about rocks to them because that's all he cares about. So it'll be okay. It's going to be no, I, I know our kids dispositionally and they are our kids. Yeah, they're, I they're do not. I not think they are going to be, they they're going to find these arguments particularly alluring. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. I love you and I love our kids. Um, oh, that would be a fun thing. I really want to begin to bring our kids into these podcasts as soon as they're cognizant enough uh, to join. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'd really love them to troll progressives who are trying to brainwash them, like <laughs> goad them along. And then we can bring into these conversations into our podcast that people can see, because I know that this is going to happen as the movement begins to spiral down, as they all realize they've destroyed their lives, they're going to increasingly and aggressively target the children of people like us to try to bring them down as well. And the more that we can bring attention to how intentional this action is and how pathetic these individuals are and how pathetic their lives are, I think it's really important in terms of framing for the next generation that they shouldn't go this path. Hmm. Agreed. Anyway, I love you, Simone. Do you have any final thoughts on feminism or your contextualization of it in a modern context? I just don't think feminism is what it is. It's like that line from the princess bride. I, I don't think that means what you think it means, whatever. I can't, I'm not quoting it right, but that's kind of just what well, that is. I, I think that's a great way to put it. It's a movement that when you ask those members, they say, we want equality. And I go, then why are none of your key members fighting for equality? Why did they laugh at men? Why did they say men should die? You know, you and also feminism should create good outcomes for women. And I'm not, I'm not seeing that happening, really. No, it ruins women's lives. Yeah. So that's that's my final thought, is that it, it is a misleading term, like so many misleading terms. Well, I love you, and I want our daughters to have great lives. And I think that couples modeling with happy and loving relationships where both partners are treated with respect is the the true thing that you should be doing if you really care about the future of women not mm. marrying yourself at a sad birthday party maybe it was a great birthday party and marrying yourself as a single person is it makes a lot of sense because when you actually think about weddings and marriages they're really just for the women so i don't know why women just don't marry themselves when they want something indulgent and then Actual marriages are more just about, oh, let's create a favorably positioned strategic alliance. That's a very sexist thing to say, Simone. How much planning did you do in our wedding? I mean. I love you to death, Simone. Our wedding was great and you did a great job putting it together. Thank you. But as you know, like, it's a woman thing. So maybe we should just decouple weddings from marriage. I don't know. I have a good one. Me too. Oh, uh, if you want to check out our Discord server, here's the link. Some of our fans have been asking for it, and uh, one of them put one together for us. Uh, so check it out. Oh, uh, and the link will also be in the description.